Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Samuel. Uh, we pray for other churches because it's a family business and dad owns it all. Amen? And their success is our success. So we continue to pray for other churches right around our city. One other thing I wanna let you know about, uh, we're in the season of Lent, we're midway uh, in the season of Lent, a time of prayer and fasting, of reflecting and just preparing ourselves for a closer walk with God as we get towards Holy Week and Easter. And what we're gonna do starting tomorrow, we've had some requests from a some additional prayer time. Starting tomorrow from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m., we're gonna open the sanctuary up. Uh, it won't be any formal corporate prayer. It'll just be open for you to come and go as you'd like. There'll be music on, lights on for you to come in and pray, be at the altar, journal, read your Bible, whatever you'd like to do. And then we'll have our corporate prayer times on Wednesday at 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. So we'll have worship, we'll have one of our leaders will share a devotion, have some private prayer time, and then a corporate prayer time Wednesday at 7 a.m. and then again, 7 p.m. Now, uh, last week, you know, we're in this series of Lamentations that I'm gonna get to in just a moment. And last week I was talking about how important it is for us to be honest with God about what's going on inside of us. And in order to be honest with God, we've gotta be honest with ourselves. And one of the examples that I used is in my own life, remembering and realizing that there was some unresolved pain in my life, some trauma that had happened, and some hurt that I just didn't acknowledge. I excused it away. And I was sharing with you how, at a time in my life, my mother recognized that I needed some good male role models in my life. And so she signed me up for Big Brothers and Big Sisters of America. And uh, my first big brother I got signed up with, this guy was cool, he had a Jeep, he took me dooning, and you know, we did all kinds of school, and, and his name was Ray, and after about, and I, and I just really gave him my heart. And after about six months, he decided it didn't fit his lifestyle anymore. And he had his reasons, and I don't judge him, and I've forgiven him, but it left a wound, like it crushed me, it hurt. And then I got another big brother named Ivan. This guy was a basketball player, Green Bay Packer fan, coach. And, and again, I gave him my heart. But after about six months, that match got terminated also. And again, it crushed my heart because I was giving these people my heart. My mom didn't give up. I got a third big brother. His name was Bruce. And uh, Bruce, when I met him, I knew we were very different. And... Um, he, he, was, he was as country as sweet tea and cornbread. And the first thing he said when he picked me up, he said, I'm a, I'm a, he noticed in my bedroom that I was a Washington Redskin fan. And we left that day and I'm in the car driving with him. He says, well, there's two things you need to know about me. One is I'm a Christian. And two is I'm a Dallas Cowboy fan. I said, well, I won't hold the first one against you. And Bruce didn't give up on me. He invested in my life a lot. Took me a lot of places, spent a lot of time with me, coached me on personal character. And even though there were maybe differences in our style preferences, there was something that bound us together. Bruce uh, took me on a ski trip with Southside Baptist Church. Up on a ski lift, ski lift broke down. I'm trapped on the ski lift with this Christian. And I mean, I grew up in the faith, right? I had, a, I had a faith. I grew up in the church, but I had never really fully surrendered and made it my personal, made it, made it mine personally. And Bruce says to me, what would happen if you fell from here right now? I'm like, what? He's like, well, I mean, if you were to go to heaven and stand, you know, and he took me through this whole thing, what would you say? To anyway, he led me to Christ right there, like a, a per surrendering my life to Jesus. And then we went back to the ski lodge and we shared it with a bunch of people and there was a great celebration and Bruce is here with me today. And um, <clears throat> Kathleen. I'm gonna, you guys sit down for just a minute because I'm gonna mess up the live stream and walk over here. This is Bruce and Nancy Wells. And Bobby and Kim, actually, they, they were also on that same ski trip there with us. And um, man, I just love you guys. And, and they're here today because they're celebrating 50 years of marriage. And yeah, 
tough woman. And uh, they're gonna renew their vows here in a little while after, at the end of the service. And they have a reception out there and, and uh, just, they wanted to be... <clears throat> Somebody better do something. <laughs> okay, Bruce is going to do something. I don't know what. I love you. <clears throat> so they wanted to be here and celebrate that with us, and I couldn't think of a more appropriate place and time to be together and some of their friends here and, and, and his other former little brothers back here. And uh, well, he's not little now. Stand up real quick. <laughs> little brother became big brother. <clears throat> Appreciate you guys, guys being here today. And um, the point of that is, is, you know, still that healing had to happen. And even though there was pain, there's hope. This person changed my life because of the time they invested. And not just with me, but with others as well. Thank you guys for being here. I'm so proud of you and love you and invite you to stick around at the end of the service. We're just gonna do it after the close of the service. We're gonna do a renewing of their vows and then we'll go celebrate out there. And you're invited, all of you invited to stay and be a part of that. There's some refreshments and things. So thanks for being here. Love you guys. We're in this series in Lamentations and um, you've experienced this. We've been talking about this for the last few weeks. Life is difficult at times. You have experienced pain that you never imagined. You certainly didn't plan for. And I don't want you to lose your faith ever or be derailed because of human disappointment or because of the failure of a religious leader. We gotta have our eyes on something bigger, our eyes on Christ, and understand that in this life there will be difficult times. And without a proper theology for dealing with grief, we will find unhealthy ways to deal with our hurt. We're gonna have disappointment, we're gonna have unmet expectations, we're gonna experience grief. And without a proper theology for that, either we will self-medicate it, we'll, get it, we'll deny it, we'll enter, enter, enter into some other escapism, some other unhealthy way of coping with that. And so the idea of doing this series in Lamentations to help us understand and maybe have a better theology for dealing with loss. Lament, Lamentations, is it's, a, it's really a prologue to the book of Jeremiah. And the context of this is they are in exile. And it, this is beautiful, this is actually art. As difficult as it is to read, and it's filled with pain and chaos, it's, it's beautiful because it's five poems. And in each poem, the, fir, the first four are an acrostic, meaning that there are 22 uh, letters in the Hebrew alphabet, chapters one, two, uh, four and five have 22 verses. Chapter three has 66 verses because each verse begins with one of the letters of the Hebrew alphabet. Chapter three, there are 66 because it does it three times. And it's beautiful to see how this is laid out in this process, the honest emotion that is being expressed before God. Lament is a prayer and pain that leads to trust. That's the simplest way I can put it. It's being honest with what we're thinking and how we're feeling before God. Last week we talked about complaining and how you bring your complaint to God and the difference in the children of Israel and how they were you know, chastised for murmuring and complaining. And what we see here with some of the lamenting Psalms and, and Jeremiah and Lamentations is that they brought their complaint to God. Instead of complaining about God behind his back, they brought it to God. They were bringing their emotions and their concerns and their questions and their very real feelings right before God. Lament is a prayer that leads us through personal sorrow and difficult questions into the truth that anchors our soul. It takes faith, it takes relationship to lament like this. Chapter one is all about the place. So the prophet says, how lonely sits the city that was full of people. The roads to Zion mourn, for none come to the festival. Jerusalem sinned greatly, and she has become filthy. And he says, for these things I weep. 
one of the reasons he's known as the weeping prophet. It's about the place. Chapter two is about the punishment. And again, this is all beautiful poetry, even though it's filled with raw emotion. He cast down from heaven to earth the splendor of Israel. He has bent his bow like an enemy. The Lord has scorned his altar and disowned his sanctuary. God intended it as judgment and punishment for the people's failure to keep covenant. Chapter one is the place. Chapter two is the punishment. Chapter three is split into two, kind of two parts. The first part is about the prophet. It becomes very personal. He says, my soul is bereft of peace. I have forgotten what happiness even is. He drove into my kidneys the arrows of his quiver. But then he switches midway through chapter three. In fact, if you were to kind of draw this as a graph, it would build like this. And there would be this peak right here in the middle of chapter three. And he begins to switch it and begin to talk about the promises of God. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. The Lord is my portion. I will hope in him. So there's this, there's this pivot from all this pain that he's pouring out, which you have to do. You have to pour your heart out before God. And then he begins to speak of the faithfulness of God. He begins to put his hope in God. We see that transition. It's a struggle that we all need to understand and we all need to embrace. One of the things that for years when we've done Youth Quake Live, the we, you know, we try to do skits and video and dance and music and preaching. And the whole idea is to, to find something that's gonna communicate to you to get this truth across, to find some way of, something that's gonna stimulate something in your brain maybe in a different way. And art has a way of doing that. I'm gonna show you a, a video right now that you've seen part of for the last couple weeks. And it's a video that was shot right over here off near the Shands, Shands Bridge. St. Mary's Church, and James, who's the dancer in the video, uh, was an instructor at Grace Conservatory, and it's a beautiful expression of this struggle, this idea of dealing with loss and grief, even the loss of a, a child, which would be the worst thing that any of us could imagine, and struggling with, what do I do with, I believe that God is good, but I'm dealing with this pain, and it seems like he's even the author of it, and if he's not the author of it, he could have done something about it, and he didn't, and I can't reconcile these two things, and there's this struggle that we go through. How do we reconcile those things? In this video, you'll see the guy struggling with that, and then today, you'll see one additional minute to what you've seen the last couple weeks. In the next couple of weeks, you'll see the final conclusion of it. And in this, la this video today, that additional minute, you'll see this angst that he has and he's looking at the church and he begins to just walk away from it. And then there's this moment of just, where else? And turns and runs back to take refuge in the Lord. Watch this video. The walls fell And the hungry child Cried out for help Did you hear the sound? Did your heart break? Does your heart break now?
your children die? Did your heart break? Does your heart break now? can relate to that struggle. When we can be honest with ourselves and honest with God and struggle like that, we will experience a deeper relationship with God and a truth that will anchor us through any storm that life may throw at us. In Matthew chapter 11, when Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went out from there to teach and preach in their cities. Now when John heard in prison about the deeds of Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, are you the one who was to come or should we look for another? And Jesus answered them, go tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear and the dead are raised up and the poor have the good news preached to them and blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Very curious, that last line. Why is Jesus saying that to John? And why is John asking this question? This is John the Baptist, the forerunner to the Messiah, the one who was prophesied about, the one who in his, in his mother's womb, as Elizabeth came into the room and Mary was there with Jesus in her womb, he leapt in his mother's womb, recognizing the presence of the Messiah. It wasn't a, are you the one? He knew. John the Baptist, who at the Jordan River says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Not, behold, are you the one? He knew. He knew it with conviction. So why now is he questioning? Because now he's in prison. And this wasn't part of the plan. Because now he's in prison and Jesus hasn't even come to see him. And so his present circumstances, the difficulty of his situation causes him to doubt. That's what difficulty will do. That's what grief will do. That's what unmet, unfulfilled expectations will do. Doubt will creep up. When we're disappointed, when we fail, when we experience difficult circumstances, because it is easy to doubt when you're in the midst of pain. In our Western culture and in Western Christianity, we have this mindset that following Jesus should make all of our wildest dreams come true. We have all these promises we stand on and we tell God what to do. You want me to remind you of your word? Will you do this? We kind of, that makes me nervous. Because when in the the Bible, when people actually experience the presence of God, what they do is they fall down like a dead man. Go away from me, I'm a sinful man. And so, so when we experience this kind of difficulty and, and, and we're told in our Western culture that we shouldn't experience difficulty, doubt creeps up. Ray Hughes is a great evangelist. The example that he likes to use is if you're about to board an airplane and let's say you're sitting in first class on the airplane, but I give you a parachute and I say, put this parachute on. It's gonna make your flight even better. It's gonna make your meal taste better. It's gonna make the in-flight movie better. You're gonna have a great experience if you wear this parachute. Well, you put it on, yeah, I want that. And you sit down and it doesn't make your experience better. Because it's too tight around your legs, you can't really breathe, you can't get comfortable in your seat, you can't even get your tray down in the, from its position to eat your meal. And you go, you know what, that guy was wrong, this isn't making my life better. You take the parachute off, you throw it down. You're wearing it for the wrong reason. If he were to tell you, put on this parachute, because at any moment, this airplane is going to fall 20,000 feet out of the sky, and this parachute will save your life. You're like, put it on, tighten it up, I don't care how uncomfortable I'll be because it's going to save my life. Right? And a lot of us embrace Christianity 
with the wrong motivation. And so we're disappointed when something doesn't work out like we expected. When that happens, what do we do? The poet in Lamentations, he makes this shift right in the midst of that pain and he begins to rehearse and call to mind the faithfulness of God. Paul told Timothy, he said, look, God remains faithful even when we are faithless. He remains faithful. Psalm 100 verse five says, the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues to all generations. In the Old Testament, many times when God would move, they would build an altar of remembrance so that they could remember his faithfulness when they experienced difficulty the next time. And they would tell the stories to remember his faithfulness. We need to recall God's faithfulness. Rehearsing God's faithfulness anchors our soul and hope can emerge out of the pain. And we see in chapter three that Jeremiah, though his circumstances have not changed, his perspective has. And this opens the door for healing to begin. And we've been promoting a book, Dark Clouds of Deep Mercy, finding the grace of God in the midst of lament. And the author identifies four truths about God's character which can help us in times of crisis turn to God. And the first one is this. And, we're, and this is right out of chapter three. So the first part of chapter three, remember, was the prophet saying, my soul is bereft of peace, I have no more happiness. He drove into my kidneys arrows like the quiver, which you saw, the, you saw James in the video even kind of reacting that way in the pain. But then, right at the peak of chapter three, he turns and he begins thinking about the goodness of God. And he says in verse 22, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They're new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion and my soul says, therefore I will hope in him. Now, let me explain the context of this. If you just Google this verse, just get on your thing, Google this verse, Jeremiah 3, 22 through 25, here's what you'll see on Google Images. Every one of these verses is overlaid with some beautiful, peaceful scene, some meadow with pretty flowers, some sunrise, right? That is not the context of Jeremiah saying this. Like we picture this verse and we picture Jeremiah walking out, the sun's coming up, seagulls are off in the distance and the ocean is very calm and he says, the steadfast love of the Lord never, his mercies, look, are new every morning. Like that's not the context. Read Lamentations. This, this verse ought to actually be overlaid of the types of images we've been seeing on the news coming out of Ukraine. The city is destroyed. The temple is destroyed. Rubble is everywhere. It's an ash heap. Jeremiah is pouring his heart out. All this grief, all this turmoil, all this sorrow. And he's walking through the rubble and he says, the steadfast love of the Lord. Maybe that's where you are and standing in the midst of some kind of rubble. And we begin to remind ourselves of the faithfulness of God. In the midst of devastation, all around him, Jeremiah chooses to remember that God is merciful, slow to anger, full of love and compassion. In fact, the dawning of each new day is a reminder of that. I want you to be reminded of that today. I don't know what difficulty you're in right now, Maybe you're not in a difficulty right now, but you will be at some point. I want you to remember that his mercy is new every day. The next part of that is that waiting on God is not a waste, verses 25 through 37. We're still in chapter three. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for a man that he bear the yoke of his youth. So often we resist waiting. We hate waiting. We live in a culture that wants everything right now. I mean, it's, we're catered, everything caters to our instant whatever, gratification, right? You guys get impatient standing in front of a microwave that you programmed. You tell it three minutes and you're like, why does it take us so long? You just told it three minutes, right? Because we, we want it faster, we want it now. We hate waiting. So when we're waiting, we try to 
manipulate circumstances. We even try to manipulate God to get him to do what we want. Waiting on God is one of the most difficult parts of the Christian walk because it requires us to admit that we are not in control. Waiting, bear the burden of our youth. What is that about? Well, learning the value of waiting early in life is an important lesson. We have a two-year-old granddaughter who doesn't understand this lesson yet. We're trying to teach her, you need to wait for certain things because when she wants something, she wants it now. She wants Coco Melon now. Coco Melon, Coco Melon, now. We'll do that later, Coco Melon now. You know, or if we're gonna go somewhere, she wants to go to the park, and we're gonna, we'll go to the park in just a little while. And you can tell her we're gonna go in two minutes, or you can tell her we're gonna go in two hours. It doesn't make a difference because she doesn't understand the difference, right? She just knows it's not right now. And so she gets upset about that, right? That's a lesson that she is learning. I wonder how, if we look like that sometimes before God, when we're wanting something. And, and the thing that we know, like when, when it's Nora and we're, she wants to go somewhere and, we're, and the answer is yes, it's just, but we can't go just yet. We have to prepare some things. So we're preparing to go do that. There are things that have to happen before we can go do that. She doesn't understand that. Right? Perhaps when we're waiting on God, perhaps that's what's going on. And maybe we don't understand it, comprehend it, or see it. We certainly learned that if you've been here for a while, you know we just completed a book study going through Esther. And we saw that in the book of Esther that God is working even when we don't see it. And even in the delay, there's a purpose. We see that. This passage here uh, in your English translations doesn't pick up on uh, the way it's laid out in the, in the Greek. And I mentioned to you how chapter three has 66 verses. And instead of each verse beginning with a letter from the Hebrew alphabet, each ver- it'll be three times with that same letter. So this, this verse here would actually read like this. And this is not even a great translation because it still doesn't have the poetic flow that you would find in Hebrew, but it would read more like this. Good is the Lord to those who wait for him. Good it is that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Good it is for a young man to bear the yoke of his youth. It begins with that right there. It's good to wait is the point. Waiting is good. There's a reason. You see between the prophet Malachi and the New Testament, 400 years of silence when it seemed that God wasn't speaking. And there was one famous rabbi who prayed a famous prayer during that period and he made this statement that even though we can't hear God, we believe God can hear us. And that 400 years God was still working and preparing for at just the right moment as we read the New Testament that the Son of God would appear, right? God's pr- so even in the silence, even in the waiting, God is working. Waiting is not a waste. The third thing is this. Whatever you're dealing with, whatever the grief may be, the final word has not been spoken. Verse 31. For the Lord will not cast off forever, In other words, this is not the final word. It's not gonna end like this. But though he calls grief, he will have compassion according to the abundance of his steadfast love. In other words, though you're going through something difficult right now, and it might even seem like God's making it happen, it's not the end. It's not the end of the story. Uh, There's a famous baseball icon, uh, Yogi Berra. And he said, it ain't over till it's over. He made that, sta- that statement famous. We've probably all heard it. It ain't over till it's over. Well, that came from Yogi Berra. It ain't over till it's over. And then it was made popular again by Lenny Kravitz in the 90s with his song, It Ain't Over. It's just, and it's a lamenting love song. It's amazing how many love songs are lamenting. <laughs> a lamenting love song. He made that popular. It ain't over till it's over. Or in the, in the 90s, there was this Christian band called the Imperials, and they had a song called Big Ball, meaning the earth. And the whole idea is this, as long as the big ball's turning, it ain't over. As long as I have breath, I'll keep fighting. Push into the end, stop at nothing, right? Because it ain't, as long as I have breath, and as long as the big ball's turning, it's not over. Sometimes we, we forget that. It feels like it is over. But I don't remind you today, it's not. 
the final word has not been spoken. One thing we do know, Romans tells us, that those who love God, for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who called according to his purpose. Even the difficult thing that we're going through, God will use it for good. God is working all things, even the bad stuff, together for good and for his glory. The final word has not been spoken. That leads me to the final point is this. God is always good, always. Even when you don't see it, and you'll see in the video the struggle that that individual that James goes through kind of coming to that point. And the struggle's important. It opens up real relationship. But we need to remember that God is good for he does not afflict from his heart or grieve the children of men. In other words, it's not in God's heart to do something hurtful. What's in his heart is good. Is good. Think of it like, like, the, like a surgeon that may have to inflict pain for a moment to cut out the disease. Or the illustration I like better because it's very personal to me is a dentist. I remember going to a dentist not long ago and I had to get a root canal. I didn't know that at the moment. I just knew I had a cavity or something. And he gives me a shot and that hurt. And then he starts to do his work. And it, I had not, it didn't, the shot didn't work. I was like, I came up out of that seat. He goes, I don't think you're numb. I'm like, you think? Maybe you should be a genius. And then he gives me another shot. And it still, it could not numb me. And he's like, man, he goes, I, I can't get you numb. I'm gonna have to send you down to the oral surgeon. So I'll go down to the oral surgeon. And then this guy gives me a shot right down the middle of my tooth. He listen to you guys. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> and it hurt really bad for like a couple seconds. And then there was like this wash. Oh my, I fell in love. I, I'm not having any more kids, but if I did, I would name them after you. You know, I mean, it, it was a happy moment, right? And then he could go in and pull out the decay. And that's, that's what it's like sometimes, that painful moment is there to pull out the disease or the decay. But even when you're feeling that kind of pain or you're looking at a difficulty in life, and I learned this years ago, I don't remember, I think it might've been Pastor Daniel that I first heard say this, I'm not sure, but the saying is this. When you look at a difficult situation and you cannot trace God's hand, you're looking at some crisis, some conflict, some difficult situation, and you cannot see how God's hand is in that. You can't trace God's hand in that situation. When you cannot trace his hand, you have to trust his heart, that God is good. And I don't understand it, but I do know that God is good. And that's what the poet and the prophet is doing in this passage, is turning and reminding himself, I don't understand all this, when the city is destroyed, the city of David, this, the, the city of promise, that's not just the promise, it is personal, it's, where, it's our home. I don't understand it, but God, I know that your love and your mercy is new every day. I know that you are good, for he does not afflict from his heart. It's not in God's heart to do home or to do harm. Psalm 34, my last verse, and then we're gonna have a little personal response time. Psalm 34 says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. In the video, you saw James struggling with this and being so hurt and so disappointed. He knows that God is real, he knows that God is good, he knows these things about God, yet he can't reconcile this pain and he begins to walk away and ultimately runs back into the church, back to God to take refuge in him. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. I'm not sure where you are today, exactly what's going on in your life, but I wanna encourage you that whatever it is to be honest with yourself, honest with God, and to begin to think about the goodness, reflect on, rehearse the goodness and faithfulness of God and take refuge in it. The Lord is good. I don't know why difficulty happens and why it's happening in your life, but I know the Lord is good. Take refuge in him. 
the band's going to come and they're going to they're going to do a song to just minister to us the Bible says that when King Saul was tormented that David would come and play the harp and sing and worship and the things that were tormenting him would be, would be driven away that it ministered to him and I'm praying that as they do this song that it will minister to you but I also know that you may need to respond in some way personal I'm a kinesthetic learner, not just auditory and visual. I gotta like engage with it. Sometimes I have to do, move and do something. And so in just a moment, I'm gonna have you stand. And as they do this song, if you need to sit, if you need to kneel, if you need to come to the altar, sometimes taking that step makes a big difference. It's just taking refuge in him and say, God, lead me on. Lead me on even in the midst of this. Would you guys stand with me? And I really don't want us to rush this moment. Make it personal. If you need to sit down there and journal something or read something or pray or, like I said, come here to the altar in the first service, people were coming up here just kneeling and just being in that place and just surrender. Bow your hearts before the Lord. I'm gonna pray and then We'll do this song, and afterwards, I'm gonna come back for a closing prayer, and then Gabe's gonna lead us through communion. Heavenly Father, you know exactly what's going on in each person's life today, here and those that are watching online, the struggles that we may be having, the confusion that we may be experiencing, the questions that are unresolved. God, help us right now to pour those things out before you, just pouring our hearts out like a a drink offering before you, just pouring our hearts out before you and just yielding to you, finding refuge in you and in your goodness. In Jesus' name. If you need to respond, I encourage you just to come and kneel or do whatever you need to do to make it personal.
us this is the gospel this is the death burial and resurrection of Jesus it reminds us of the the price that was paid on the cross but the tragedy of the cross is not the end the empty tomb gives us hope and we're gonna receive this in just a moment before we do though the Bible says that we should examine our hearts and we're gonna pray a prayer I'm gonna lead you in a prayer but I encourage you to repeat after me you meet it in faith. You make it your prayer, a prayer of confession. We're going to admit we've all turned away at times. We've all rebelled. We've all gone our own way. We've all sinned. We're going to pray a prayer of confession, and then we're going to pray a prayer of surrender, a prayer of salvation, just yielding to Jesus as our Lord, and then we'll share communion together. Just bow your hearts and, and pray this and repeat after me. Heavenly Father, I confess that I have sinned against you in my thoughts, my words, and my actions. Have mercy on me and forgive me through your Son, my Savior. Lord Jesus, I believe you lived on this earth. You died for my sin. You rose and now live. I yield to you. Be my Lord. And Holy Spirit, fill me with power and passion to follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. 